Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the June 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of The Development of Revolutionary Strikes and Street Demonstrations by Lenin from 1913. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this piece was published in Social Democrat number 30, January 12, 1913, and published according to the text in Social Democrat. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1975, Moscow, Volume 18. Translated by Stepan Apresian, HTML transcription and markup by R. Sambala, and it's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. So this piece was from January 1913, which was still almost five years off from the October Revolution of 1917, but certainly after the first Russian Revolution of 1905. This period had ups and downs, but overall it did see the buildup of revolutionary activity between the first Russian Revolution in 1905, when certain reforms were exacted from the Tsarist government, and then February 1917, when the Tsar was deposed and a capitalist-led provisional government was installed, and then finally later that year, October, when the socialists overthrew the provisional capitalist government. Also, this piece is the fourth and final installment of a little mini-series that I did during the June 2022 edition of Socialism for All by Lenin about strikes and demonstrations. The pieces uploaded for this were On Strikes from 1899, Economic and Political Strikes from 1912, draft of a new law on strikes from 1902, and this piece, Development of Revolutionary Strikes and Street Demonstrations from 1913. So let's get into the text. It has long since been pointed out, and recognized by all, that the year 1912 was an outstanding landmark in the development of the strike movement, but not all have realized and taken proper account of it. Let us take the data on political strikes in the first 11 months of the year. The result is as follows. 1905 saw 1,052,000 political strikers, 1906, 642,000, 1907, 540,000, then a gap, then in 1912, about 900,000. The number of political strikers in the first nine months was 700,000, according to the most conservative estimates. Strikes in connection with clearing up the matter of the delegates in St. Petersburg involved up to 50,000 people the strikes in protest against the Sebastopol executions, and the strike on November 15, the day when the Duma, or Parliament, opened, involved 188,000 persons, according to the Moscow Manufacturers Society. These data are for the period before November 20. Obviously, 900,000 is a minimum figure. Even subtracting 100,000 that are hardly comparable with 1905 to 1907, factories outside the province of the factory inspectorate, we get 800,000. In any case, the movement definitely surpassed that in 1906 and 1907, and fell only slightly short of that in 1905. What does this mean? The national scale of the movement at present is, of course, much smaller than in 1905. Consequently, the beginning of the revolutionary upswing is incomparably higher today than it was before the First Revolution. Consequently, the coming Second Revolution, even now, reveals a much greater store of revolutionary energy in the proletariat. The proletariat has grown in numbers by a minimum of 20%. Its concentration has increased. The purely proletarian mainstay of the movement has become stronger due to accelerated dissociation from the land. The size of the proletarian and semi-proletarian population in domestic industry, handicrafts, and agriculture has grown to an enormous extent, defying calculation. Lastly, there has been an increase in the political consciousness, experience, and determination of the foremost democratic class. This is admitted by all, but not all can bring themselves to think out all the implications. Not all can bring themselves to face the truth and admit that we are witnessing revolutionary mass strikes, the beginning of a revolutionary upsurge. This is indicated first and foremost by the fundamental and most objective fact 
one least of all permitting of subjective interpretation, namely the scope of the movement. In no country of the world would it be possible, unless there were a revolutionary social situation, to rouse hundreds of thousands of workers to political action for the most varied reasons several times a year. But in our country, this rise is taking place spontaneously because tens of millions of the semi-proletarian and peasant population are passing on, if one can use this expression, to their vanguard, a sentiment of concentrated indignation, which is surging up and overflowing. The Russian workers' revolutionary strike in 1912 was national in the fullest sense of the term, for what should be understood by a national movement is not at all one with which, in the conditions of a bourgeois democratic revolution or capitalist revolution, the whole bourgeoisie, or at least the liberal bourgeoisie, is in agreement. Only opportunists hold that view. On the contrary, a national movement is one which expresses the objective needs of the whole country and aims its heaviest blows at the central forces of the enemy opposing the country's development. A national movement is one which has the sympathy of the vast majority of the population. Such precisely is the workers' political movement this year, a movement which has the sympathy of all working and exploited people, of all Democrats, however weak, downtrodden, disunited, and helpless they may be. The more definite demarcation between liberalism and democracy, achieved not without a struggle against those who aspired to, quote, wrest the Duma from the hands of the reactionaries, is a tremendous advantage of the new movement. If the revolution is to succeed, it must know as exactly as possible with whom it can go into battle, which of its allies is unreliable, and who is its real enemy. That is why the direct actions of the liberals, the cadet party, against the new revolution are so very significant. And that is why the slogan of a republic, which clears the minds of all Democrats willing to fight from the monarchist, as well as, quote, constitutional, illusions which sapped so much the strength of the onslaught in 1905 is of the most exceptional importance, by comparison with Europe, in Russia just now. Of historic importance in the process of growth of the new revolution in Russia are two factors. Firstly, the April and May strikes, during which the St. Petersburg workers, in spite of the arrest of their leading organization, the St. Petersburg Committee, put forward the slogan of a republic, an eight-hour working day, and confiscation of the landed estates. Secondly, the November strikes and demonstrations, see letters from Riga and Moscow. The same thing happened in St. Petersburg, but the arrests swept away our correspondence. Footnote there, this refers to reports from Riga and Moscow about workers' strikes and demonstrations, published in Social Democrat No. 30 on January 12, 1913. On November 11, 1912, the Riga workers organized a protest demonstration against the death sentences on a group of sailors of the battleship Ioan Zlataust, passed by a court-martial in Sebastopol, against the torturing of political prisoners and against the war that had begun in the Balkans. Over 1,500 workers marched through the streets of Riga singing revolutionary songs and carrying red flags. They were received sympathetically by the population. On November 12, many large factories in the city began a political strike. On November 8, the workers in a number of Moscow factories went on strike in protest against the Sevastopol executions. There was also a demonstration, but the police boon dispersed it. Continuing, the slogans of those demonstrations were not only down with the death penalty, down with war, but also long live the revolutionary working class and the revolutionary army. In the streets of St. Petersburg, Riga, and Moscow, the proletariat held out its hand to those foremost fighters of the Mujik armed forces who had risen heroically against the monarchy. And I just want to comment here, you know, Lenin talks about the historic importance in the process of growth of the new revolution, there being two factors. So one of them is these revolutionary strikes, putting forward the slogan of a republic, eight-hour working day, confiscation of the landed estates, and then slogans of other demonstrations, down with the death penalty, down with war, etc. You know, we need to organize not just on social media, but organize in real life to make these demands and launch large-scale demonstrations. This is how you actually pick up real-world momentum, okay? The social media, it's there, great. We have, you know, a means of communicating within the movement and also from the movement to the 
population at large. But you also have to join and build left parties that are embracing this kind of message. And, you know, the Democratic Party is a party of capital, even the, quote, progressive wing of it, that's never going to be any good. The Green Party is the bare minimum. And then there are other left parties. I think that probably what we really need is a coalition of all the left parties working together on goals that are commonly shared. I think that that is practical and realistic. But, you know, making these demands loudly in public and picking up more support as we go, you know, confining it just to online really doesn't work long run. Continuing. The liberal bourgeoisie is against a new revolution, against revolutionary mass strikes. Just a comment here, when Lenin talks about a new revolution, so this is again 1913, first month of 1913, he's talking about, you know, a new revolution. Well, what was the old revolution? So again, that's the revolution of 1905, when some concessions were wrested from the czarist government. And so the bourgeoisie made out okay in the 1905 revolution. He's saying that they're against another one. Like, they're happy with the reforms that they got there, and so they're against revolutionary mass strikes because they feared that, you know, if there was another revolution, that this could maybe not go the way of capitalism, but go towards the workers. And indeed, that's exactly what happened in 1917. But just to show, you know, the liberal capitalists, they are supportive of a certain amount of revolution and reform, but again, only to the point that benefits them to set up capitalism on what they think is going to be a long-term basis. Continuing. But the liberals are by no means opposed to political strikes in general. That is, if these are only evidence of a revival and support merely the liberal slogan of constitutional reform. And objectively, irrespective of their good intentions, our liquidators are mere servants of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie. They marked both historic moments of the upswing by pronouncements against revolutionary strikes. In Nedsky Golos, number one, on May 20, 1912, the unforgettable and incomparable V. Yezhov rebelled against, quote, complicating economic strikes by political strikes, and vice versa, against their, quote, harmful lumping together. And footnote there, we've covered that on the channel, along with notes on liquidationism and what that is, in Lenin's Economic and Political Strikes from 1912. Continuing. In November 1912, the liquidationist Lutch, too, was up in arms against strikes. Afterwards, it tried to put inattentive people on a false scent by referring to the fact that the Social Democratic group, too, was against the November 15 strike. But anyone who looks at all into the meaning of the event will easily see through Lutch's trickery. Yes, both the Social Democratic group and the St. Petersburg Committee found the November 15 strike inopportune. They sounded a warning against that particular strike on that particular day. It was the duty of the working class press to report this, and Lutch and Pravda did. But Lutch did something else besides. After the event of November 15, when the most zealous in striking was the very same Vyborg district, which, until then, had been most of all linked with the Mensheviks, and after the movement had grown to the dimensions of a demonstration, the sagacious Lutch carried articles, an editorial, and following the editorial of November 17, a feuilleton on November 21st, crying out against the, quote, dangerous frittering way of forces, declaring that, quote, if strikes are used frequently, people will stop sympathizing with them. Advancing the slogan, let us seek a different path, and nothing is to be gained by outbreaks, and howling against, quote, playing at strikes. That is the kind of, quote, philosophy advocated by you liquidator gentlemen and long familiar to the St. Petersburg workers, both from Nevsky Golos and from speeches by members of your, quote, initiating group that has gained you the legitimate hatred and contempt of the St. Petersburg workers. A particular strike may be unfortunate or take place at an unfortunate moment, but only liberals and counter-revolutionaries are free to describe as, quote, playing at strikes one of the world's greatest movements, which brought into action almost a million proletarians. Frequent strikes are apt to exhaust the workers. It may well be, therefore, that we shall have to call for shorter strikes and for demonstrations that have been better prepared. But the event of November 15 was remarkable precisely as a new step forward in the demonstration movement. Instead of honestly admitting your mistake, 
for you were plainly mistaken as to the significance of November 15. You liquidators began to talk, like the most brazen liberals, about the, quote, political illiteracy of the revolutionary appeal, you who are repeating the ABC of liberal politics. Let the workers judge the worth of the liquidators' smooth-spoken talk about their, quote, unity with the party, when it happens that, at the time of the rise and development of revolutionary strikes and demonstrations, the liquidators launch a struggle against them, using the legal press to revile illegal appeals. However, there is a more profound reason for the liquidators' campaign against strikes. The liquidators are slaves of the liberals, and the liberals have really begun to feel ill at ease because of the stubborn character of revolutionary strikes. The, quote, progressist factory owner has begun to grumble and even to rage. The Milyakovs now fear lest their block with Rodzianko should be disturbed. Liquidationist policy serves to subject the workers to the liberals. Marxist policy raises the workers to the role of leaders of the peasantry. One cannot speak of this legally, liquidator gentlemen, but one must think of it and tell about it to those who want to be revolutionary social democrats. In free constitutional Europe, political strikes for the time being, so long as the socialist revolution has not yet begun, serve the struggle for individual reforms. In slave, Asiatic, Tsarist Russia, which is drawing near her next bourgeois democratic revolution. Political strikes are the only serious means of stirring up the peasantry, and the better part of the peasant army, of shaking them up and rousing them to a revolutionary struggle. The time has passed, fortunately for Russia, when there was no one to, quote, go among the people, but heroic solidary narodniks, populists. The time is passing when solitary terrorists could speak of, quote, rousing the people by terrorism. Russia has left those sad times behind. In 1905, the revolutionary proletariat found for itself a different way to go among the people and a different means of drawing the masses into the movement. That means is revolutionary strikes, stubborn strikes shifting from place to place, from one part of the country to another, recurrent strikes, strikes which rouse the backward to a new life of struggle for economic improvements, strikes which brand and lash every salient act of violence or tyranny, every crime of czarism, strike demonstrations which unfurl the red banner in the streets of the capital cities and bring revolutionary speeches and revolutionary slogans to the crowd, to the mass of the people. Such strikes cannot be called forth artificially, but neither can they be stopped once they have begun to involve hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Let the liberal, who is moved by being given a seat beside Rodzianko, tell the workers, quote, Brothers, no more outbreaks. Seek a different path. Take up the peaceful trade union movement. Prepare yourselves earnestly for an open European party. Don't incite the Mujik to rebellion. Don't waste your energy on strikes, or we shall stop sympathizing with you. The workers will know how to assess such talk, and they will see through it even in the garb of the, quote, near-Marxist expressions of any of the Luch writers. The workers will concentrate on deliberately supporting, strengthening, developing, and consolidating the spontaneously growing revolutionary strike to prepare the peasants and the armed forces for a rising. If strikes exhaust the workers, they should be carried out intermittently, enabling some of the forces to rest while the forces that are rested or fresh are roused up to take the struggle. Shorter strikes should be called. Occasionally, strikes should be replaced by demonstrations. But the important thing is that strikes, meetings, and demonstrations should take place continuously, that the whole peasantry and the armed forces should know of the workers' stubborn fight, and that the countryside, even the most out-of-the-way corners of it, should see that there is unrest in the towns, that, quote, their people have risen in revolt, that they are waging a life-and-death struggle, that they are fighting for a better life, for higher pay, for an end to the outrages and tyranny of the authorities, for the transfer of the landed estates to the peasants, for the overthrow of the Tsar's landlord monarchy, for a republic. It is essential that the smoldering resentment and subdued murmurings of the countryside should, along with the indignation in the barracks, find a center of attraction in the workers' revolutionary strikes. We must work on this indefatigably, and we shall live to see the day when the proletariat, jointly with the peasantry and the armed forces, brings down the landlords and overthrows the Tsarist monarchy by a people's uprising. P.S. Luch is making progress. After the unsophisticated VA, number 56, comes the diplomatic F.D., 
number 65. Footnote there. VA was V.M. Abrasimov, a Menshevik liquidator, subsequently exposed as an agent provocateur. Also, F.D. was F.I. Don, leader of the Menshevik liquidators. Back to the text. But for all his, quote, diplomacy, the meaning of F.D.'s statements is the same. He is against revolutionary strikes. We are faced with an out-and-out -out liberal to whom it never occurs that strikes awaken the peasants and lead them to insurrection, that strikes develop revolutionary agitation among the masses and awaken the armed forces, and that it is necessary to pass from strikes, insofar as they are exhausting, to street demonstrations, etc. FD's vulgar liberal phrases about the struggle for the right to organize as the, quote, immediate task a constitutional reform, quote, on the order of the day, under Treschenko, is the sole cover for Luch's fight against revolutionary strikes. It is not enough, liquidator gentlemen. And that's the end of the audiobook. So, basically what Lenin is saying here is that when people are getting out in the streets by, you know, the hundreds of thousands, this is a positive sign. You want to see that. Individual strikes, individual demonstrations, people can quibble about whether this one was perfectly strategic, perfectly opportune or not. But the fact is, you want a rising tide of people who are indignant enough that they're getting out in the streets and making themselves heard, taking what direct actions they can to advance their own class interests, and trying to communicate their message to the rest of the working population to try to spread that sentiment and pull more people into the movement. This is how we need to be mobilizing people, by the hundreds of thousands, by the millions, by the tens of millions. Currently in 2022 USA, people are getting up the courage to post more and more things on social media and to engage in conversation there with other people about what's you know appropriate next steps and what kind of demands should working people be making and so on and so on the problem with social media is that it's really skewed you know certain figures are way louder than others and not because they're well organized with a lot of people backing them but because they have money to navigate the media environment even the alternative media and so they're when somebody comes in what people tend to see first they're not necessarily the best, it's just this sort of skewed playing field. You can't really trust that because it's not necessarily supported by any kind of grassroots organic movement of, you know, widespread support. On social media, as part of, you know, marketing, you can buy followers, you can buy likes on posts, you can buy retweets, you can buy, you know, and it doesn't matter. YouTube, SoundCloud, like, it does not matter everywhere can be gamed and manipulated. So social media is good for a lot of people, you know, getting out there and talking to other people and sharing particular things. There is a lot there that is grassroots and organic. However, some of the loudest voices are standing on top of a lot of money. And even when they claim to talk about socialism or just progressive politics generally or populist politics, whatever, these are not really the best, most informed representations of what working people should be doing right now in terms of our politics and organizing. Many of them are, we'll just go ahead and say, flat-out grifters who are teaching such bastardized versions of politics that they need to be completely unlearned before people who have sort of gotten off on that foot can really get started in the real world fighting for their own interests. So where do we go from here? You know, again, we're having more of a national conversation in the U.S. about capitalism. This is really a step forward. Uh, you know, that happened after 2008, and you saw it with Occupy, etc. Capitalism had not really been on the table up for discussion for a very long time prior to that. People just didn't really talk about it. Now, you're seeing more and more people just openly embracing socialism you know, it doesn't always mean Marxism, but you're seeing people at least starting to adopt the label again. And of course, some of you have made it out to, you know, channels like this, which are Marxist, Marxist, Leninist, etc. So these are steps forward, but we still have a lot to do in the real world once people have, you know, gone through sort of socialist school or boot camp for a couple of years in this whole political media online environment. Once you sort of know what you're doing, you have to take it to your community and join the fight. 
or in some cases start the fight or pick up the fight after somebody else, you know, put down the torch for a while, whatever it is. But you need to be involved in that. I'm reminded here of uh, somebody asked me recently in the comments, what was, you know, Lenin's role in this? How did Lenin see himself as a leader, etc.? So it's important to understand Lenin and the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, and they weren't all just having a conversation. They were factions within the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, an organized political force that actually had representatives in the government. They were not merely tweeting at each other, in other words. They were not merely writing articles and doing reactions and responses to each other. They were actually involved in the process of building political power in the real world and then advancing that within the government, within the parallel government, the Soviets, within the trade unions, on and on and on. So this is something that is sorely lacking in the United States. Obviously, there are major challenges within the election system of the United States, which in many ways is just sort of for display purposes only. But a concerted coalition of left forces could certainly take it on and find some way to make inroads somewhere. And of course, you know, elections, that's just one form of class struggle. There are many other avenues that need to be followed simultaneously. And the strategizing for that simply can't happen within a capital dominated party like the Democratic Party. So, you know, you'll hear Social Democrats often say, by the way, just to make a distinction here, when Lenin talks about Social Democrats back in 1912, this was the general term for Marxists. There wasn't the split yet of what we would call Social Democrats today, who are reformist welfare capitalists versus, you know, socialists or communists today who believe in abolishing capitalism entirely. So just a difference to be noted there. Anyway, when social democrats of today, the reformist welfare capitalist type, talk about, oh, we got to run as democrats or we're using the democratic party as a tool. First of all, no, you're not. It's using you. But you say we got to win as democrats. What I would say to that is even when you, quote, win as a democrat, you lose in the overall class struggle. First of all, the Democratic Party is going to hollow out your positions because eventually they will sanction you in one way or another, really preventing you from pursuing anything of worth there. Second of all, it's not a suitable organizing hub, which that is what needs to come first and foremost. You need an organizing hub, a party which is free of bourgeois influence, where workers can come together and talk about working class interests and strategize and plan for class struggle far beyond just engaging in the electoral system. And the Democratic Party is just completely unsuitable for that. Anyway, when Lenin was writing this stuff, he wasn't just sort of, you know, writing it for general informational purposes. He was at the head of a revolutionary party organized of many, many people that was engaged in real world struggle. This is just simply not the case with most of the U.S. left. I've said many times, U.S. left seems to have two modes. One, trying to reform the Democratic Party, which is not reformable. And then two, dropping out and sort of doing nothing but talking. That is just simply not going to fly at this point. People have to get organized and truly engage in struggle in planned, strategic, organized ways with an eye towards building this up and creating revolutionary change, not just tweeting hashtag general strike or, you know, when some story about a landlord comes up posting a Mao meme. I mean, that serves a certain purpose in terms of agitating and spreading the message about alternatives to capitalism. But you can't actually affect change by doing that alone. That is where organization comes in. You just simply have to join and build one or more workers, parties, organizations, etc and do that difficult but vital process. We read Lenin, we read Mao, etc. today, why? Because they showed that their ideas and the ways that they carried them out were effective in liberating people, in actually following through on the desires, the aspirations of the working class for liberation from capitalism. Simply just tweeting about it is not enough. Simply just posting on Facebook about it or any other social media is not enough. Again, media, it's important 
for communicating, for sharing information, for agitating, and so on. But if this isn't tied to some real world organizing and pretty quick, we're never going to see the sort of buildup of revolutionary activity that has been described in this little mini series here, or really in anything else on the channel. To take one example, look at the uprisings of 2020. There were mass demonstrations all over the United States against police brutality, against racist capitalism, which really racism underpins capitalism in the United States. They're deeply intertwined. The entire history of U.S. capitalism is closely interwoven with racism and ethnic and religious discrimination and prejudice and with sexism and with heterosexism and on and on. All forms of bigotry are closely interwoven with capitalism. But while a lot of people did get radicalized by the demonstrations, by the conversations that were had then, there was some really good struggle happening that honestly to me was like a breath of fresh air. It was like finally people in the U.S. standing up, not taking it anymore. It's been um, disconcertingly, disappointingly quiet since then. But anyway, what happened? It got co-opted by the Democratic Party. Why? Because organized political forces can do that. So if workers don't want to habitually, repeatedly be co-opted and have whatever we build up spun into either the Democratic Party or into sort of the right populist, you know, MAGA fascist vortex, whatever it is, if you want to hang on to that energy for yourself, you have to get organized as an independent force capable of historic action on your own. The U.S. left simply is not organized in such a way now. And it seems hostile, disdainful of organizing. You have to put this behind you. Just suck it up, join something, start fighting. Otherwise, all the energy that you put into this struggle, you might as well just pour it directly down the drain because it's going to have fleeting impact and it's just not going to be fed into something larger, something that lasts, something that can be built up over time honed and used as a weapon against capitalism. This is what we want. We want that weapon. We are that weapon, but only if we organize. All right, I'm going to leave it there for this video. What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comment section as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening. And thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, we don't run ads on this channel, so that support is vital. Head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful and have allowed me to spend a lot more time creating content for this channel than I would have been able to do without that support, so I really appreciate it. Also, after the content has been created and uploaded, engagement counts. Like, share, subscribe. Leave a comment, even if it's thanks, good video, random letters, whatever it is. But... All of that really helps. The channel has been growing steadily. We're on the road to a subscriber base of 10,000 as I record this. We're at like 8250 right now. That is phenomenal. That's outstanding. And that is because people like you have been showing up, have been engaging with the videos, have been sharing it with other people. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people educated. So congratulations to us all for taking steps away from liberalism, you know, from what wherever you came from politically. Good for you for stepping away from it and coming to learn Marxism because this works. Everything else just sort of plays to the capitalists and doesn't change anything. So thanks again, and we will see you hopefully in the streets and in the next video.